Hey there, so this video is about what to expect at your first court date. My name is Veronica. I help people who have been arrested put their criminal cases behind them so that they can enjoy their freedom and their lives. Now, again, this video is going to be what to expect at your first court date, what happens at your first court date. Now, this is a question that I have been asked so many times by not just my clients, but you know, I'll have potential clients who ask me this, um, pro bono clients who ask me this, and I personally would be wondering this if I got arrested and I didn't know what was going to happen um, in my criminal case. I would wonder, is it a trial? Should I bring evidence? Am I going to go to jail? I don't know. Um, so let's just go through, and this is going to be a bit of a long video. I wanna go through everything that generally happens and could happen at your first court date, okay? Um, and if you are my client, right? I, I'm sending this video to my clients as well. Um, do not, so some of the things in this video that are going to be scary, and I will mention those at the time, if I thought that this were going to happen, we would talk about it beforehand. So if I have not mentioned this, you are okay. Um, anyway, so when, so you may not know this, and I wouldn't have thought this, and I didn't know this before I ever practiced criminal defense, even as a, a baby lawyer, I didn't know, that when you get arrested and you're given a court date, and maybe you bond out, you pay your bail bondsman, maybe $5,000, whatever it is, um, and you're told, okay, you must be at court on this particular date. What is actually, and you think, oh shit, there's a criminal case against me, right? There actually isn't at that point. I know that sounds weird, um, but there isn't because the DA still has to file charges against you. So the DA will look at the police report. They will look at um, your criminal record. They will sometimes talk to the police officers involved, look at whatever photos the police officers submitted, and they decide, do we want to actually file this case? Now, as you may know, if you're my client, um, what we want to do beforehand is submit a do not file packet, and I want to try to talk to the DA ahead of time. So what that means is we submit, so the DA, if you do nothing, the DA is just going to look at the police report, your criminal record, um, and make a determination. But that's kind of scary because that's obviously a lopsided investigation, right? They're looking only at one side. The police officer, obviously, whatever he writes in the police report about the person he arrested is not going to be good for the person who's arrested. He's trying to make him look bad and guilty so that the arrest is justified. Um, so what we want to do is, you know, people call me and they will... They'll tell me reasons why they are a good person, they can't have this case go on their record, the other person is lying, whatever, they give me the, this information. That's not in whatever the DA is looking at. It's not in the police report, right? We need to get it in there. We need to, not in the police report, we need to get it in the DA's file. We need it to be basically a counter police report. So when the DA is looking at this, they're saying, Okay, not, we have the police report here, sure. They have a whole stack of police reports, right? Thousands of people arrested in LA County, you know, every, every week. And they're deciding which ones do we want to prosecute, which do we want to throw out. We don't have enough resources to prosecute them all. We want yours to have not just the police report, but a counter police report. Something that shows all the good things about you, any hardships that you have, whatever we can get in there, your side of the story from an attorney. Um, do not talk to the police. Do not give your side of the story to the police. But you can have an attorney do it. If I get something wrong, n nobody can use that against you, right? So um, we want to have all of that in there. If there are fo if maybe you were injured and you were actually just defending yourself, all of that, um, depending on the case, we want to give to the DA. Um, but anyway, going back to your first court date. So you're told it's going to be at 8.30 a.m., Sometimes they write 8 a.m., it's at 8.30, but get there at 8, no matter what they write. Um, and you show up to the courthouse, you wait in a giant line, maybe you feel some anxiety, but if I get in at 8.35, you're okay if you get in at 8.35, um, in most cases. Uh, there's some courtrooms in, I think, Compton, Department D, where you may not want to do that. Um, but, you know, if you have an attorney there, it's all good. Anyway, at that first court date, 
you let's say you got a citation or your bail bondsman did not tell you which department you go to department means courtroom why did they call them department i really don't know they should just call them courtroom they also have room numbers very confusing anyway you probably are going to once you get through security be like where the heck do i go okay so in every courthouse in la county there are going to be monitors um very close to security depending on the courthouse um there are monitors for sure and you need to find them there are a group of about four monitors at every single courthouse in la county um and for some of them like for example let's say at pomona they are by the elevators at lancaster um, antelope valley they're going to be to the left of security they're in different locations so you may have to look around a bit, but I promise you that they are there in every single courthouse in LA County. Um, it is uh, about four um, TVs basically that are flipped so that they're vertical, um, which now I realize how strange that is now that I'm thinking about it, that they're all vertical. Anyway, um, all clustered together. And on those monitors, it's all defendants that are listed there, right? So it's first name, last name, or I'm sorry, last name, first name, and you, so look for your name or look for the defendant's name. If you're not the defendant, you're a family member and see if the person's name is on there. Now let's go through possibility number one. That person's name is not on there. And you're like, what the heck? Where then can I leave? Am I good? No, do not leave <laughs> because here is, the process and i'm sorry i wish that this were going to be at like step one two three this is very easy but it's not because our government is not that organized frankly um so how it goes is that if your name is not on there but you have a piece of paper or you were told be here at this day on this time it says on the sheriff's department website whatever you have some evidence you're supposed to be there what you need to do is go to the clerk's office okay so if you have an attorney, I mean, we take care of all this for you, but um, if you don't, you need to go to the clerk's office. In some courthouses, you need to make sure you look for a criminal clerk's office. Sometimes there's like a, gen or a general or civil clerk. Go to the, the criminal clerk's office if there is a differentiation in that courthouse. Okay, and what you need, so what you'll do is present, first of all, tell them that you are there for, you were, you were arrested, give, have the arrest date ready. Um, here's your first name, your last name, your date of birth. They want that information, booking number sometimes. And you were told that you had an arraignment today. And then they're probably going to tell you at that point, if your name was not on the list, they're probably going to tell you, well, nothing has been filed yet. Um, and then what you wanna ask them, and I'll explain that in a minute, what you wanna ask them is, well, how long do they have to file today? Um, so nothing has been filed yet. That means that the DA has not filed charges against you yet. So that first process I was talking about, they haven't actually completed it yet. Um, and many times that does happen where it, generally it's a good sign. Generally it means that they are considering reducing it or not filing it. Not always. Um, it could mean that it's more serious charges. I had a client that I, I got him after this happened to him, but it was much more serious charges um, than initially uh, he expected. And he was there for a lot of the day. So, but generally for, if it's gonna be a domestic violence case at 273.5, um, generally that's a good thing. Um, now, and all of this, obviously this is if you're out of custody. Um, if you're in custody and you have never gotten out and it's your first court date, they're making this decision, but you don't have to go to the clerk's office. You, cannot go to the clerk's office in that case. Um, anyway, you wanna know how long they had to file because you're gonna be there all freaking day potentially. And you wanna figure out like, how do you know if they file, right? Good question. I don't know how people without an attorney figure this out um, without a lot of stress and annoyance, but I'll just tell you that what you have to do is generally go to the DA's office, get a phone number. Sometimes the clerk's office will give you a phone number for them. You want to check with them like, hey, has this been filed? And you also want to check with the clerk's office. So sometimes the DA's office is not that nice to you if you're an arrestee. Um, so, and sometimes they don't answer, but check with the DA's office and the clerk's office. Both of those offices will receive information as to when 
the case is filed. Um, and you must stick around until whatever the clerk's office tells you. You must stick around that day. So sometimes it's 4.30 p.m. And is that crazy? Yes. Can you get the phone numbers and probably go get some food and come back? I mean, probably, yeah. <laughs> um, if it's my case as an attorney, you know, once they know there is an attorney on it, they do move things along a bit faster, I've found. Um, so that is helpful. But what we need to do is basically stick around and find out, are they going to file against you? And if so, then you need to go to a courtroom and then there's a whole other process. And so let's, this, the process is the exact same as if we go to step or option two, which is that your name is on, um, is on the monitors. Um, so you would basically go to the option two process. Okay. So option two, either you already have a, department assigned or you have been told or or you look at the monitors and you see okay veronica barton that's me i'm supposed to go to department 100 whatever it is right and so you know you look there's going to be a directory somewhere that says here are the different usually by the elevators saying like here are the different courtrooms on the different floors you go up there now here's why you should be early for your first court date especially if you don't have an attorney if you have an attorney I mean, we, we make the process as easy as possible for you. We know what we're doing. We're there all the time. But especially if you're there alone, get there early because at some point, usually around 830, there's going to be a deputy in many courts that comes outside the courtroom and checks everybody in. If you miss that, you're going to go and be like, what the heck am I supposed to do? Obviously, if you don't find out until later that charges were filed against you and where to go, um, you won't know any of that until later and that will be annoying. But um, go there go there early if you can it, it will be a much easier process um okay so charges are filed against you you get to the department what do you do if there's a deputy out, if it's before 8 30 just hang out right wait until 8 30 the doors will open most courtrooms sometime between 8 30 and 9 30 most hopefully some of them don't um van nuys notorious for not um norwalk pretty bad sometimes uh, anyway, wait and see what the instructions are from the deputy. Some courtrooms right now, so before COVID, everybody could just come in. You would come in, you would get in line, you would check in, and that was it. But some courtrooms are a little bit um, iffy about that. They're saying only come in like post-COVID and during COVID um, if we tell you to come in, in which case you just sit outside on the benches for a long time. So uh, just... If you can hear the instructions, that'll be very, very helpful to you. Um, let's say you miss it though. Let's say you're late that morning. I get it. Let's say that you had to go to the clerk's office and they just filed at like 10 a.m. It's not your fault, but you now did not get the benefit of the instructions. What you need to do is you need to find the bailiff in that courtroom. So you need to find the bailiff. They are probably gonna be mean to you. Okay, it's their, don't take it personally. It's their job to keep order in the court, I guess. They have to seem macho and they may not be that strong, they may not be that um, physically able to actually take anyone down, so sometimes they're kind of jerks. Um, not always, some of them are great. But anyway, you need to find that person and you need to check in with them, okay? Especially if you don't have an attorney, go and check in with the deputy. Make sure you do that. Um, that is how they know not to issue a warrant for your arrest and have your whatever bill you paid forfeited. So make sure that you do that. Um, okay, so now you are in the courtroom and what can you expect? So once you've checked in and, and this is for my clients too, once you've checked in and you are trying to figure out what's going to happen at this court day, right? You're wondering in advance and you're wondering that day, is the judge going to ask me any questions? Am I going to have to plead guilty? I am guilty. Should I just plead guilty? Here are the answers to that. So... If you are out of custody, right, you're not in jail anymore, you bonded out, you're out of jail, here is what is going to happen. Your attorney, whether it's me, the public defender, or another private attorney, we are going to talk to the prosecutor and we are going to obtain the initial discovery. What is discovery? Discovery is all of the evidence that the DA's office has that they have provided to us. Um, in most cases, for the first court date, all that we get is going to be like a police report 
and whatever the charges are against you. So we find out misdemeanor or felony, if it was like a 273.5. Um, we find out a lot of that. But there may be more evidence, and in most cases there is. For example, body-worn video. The cops are wearing cameras on their lapels or... Um, lapels, I'm not sure if that's the right word. Whatever, on their shirts, they're wearing, they're wearing body-worn video, and maybe we want that because we think it'll be good for us. Or, you know, whatever else it may be, and they don't turn it over. And honestly, as an aside, sometimes that's a good thing because sometimes my client and I know that whatever's on there is going to be bad for my client and then we just don't request it. Because if we don't request, the DA is very slow to obtain all of it. I mean, here's how it goes. And this was very surprising to me. You would think that if someone is arrested and they are put in jail and they are told, hey, you have to pay this very large amount of money to a bail bondsman um, or who must pay us a large amount of money in order to get out, you would think that there would be a stack, right? Of here's all the evidence we have against him, right? It, even, and I'm applying this to very low level cases, to murder cases. You would think that there would at least be like, here's most of it. There might be like, you know what? And there's this one surveillance video that we're having trouble like downloading or extra something, maybe. But for the most part, or like we're still waiting on the gunshot residue results, something. Um, or DNA, but here's everything we have, that we have looked at, that we have in our possession as the police. We've given this pile to the DA, and now the DA gives it to your attorney so that we can look at it and figure out, you know, what, how strong is their case even, right? But that is not how it goes. Um, and maybe this is a whole other video, but just very briefly, I'll explain that how it goes is that it's a very slow trickle to get all this stuff. If we know we want something specifically, we have to demand it. But at this first court date, what we will get, generally, no video, is we'll just get the charges against you and the police report. And part of the reason for that, I've discerned, is that many people, especially represented by the public defender, will plead guilty on the very first court date. They will get an offer. They'll accept it. And what's the point in taking all this time to burn all these CDs and DVDs and obtain all this stuff if the person's just going to plead guilty? Um, I don't think that that's right. I think, yes, of course, I have clients who will plead guil guilty or no contest. In LA, usually no contest. But I want to be able to advise them first, is that a good idea? Like, do they have you? Are you fucked? Because if you're not, then why would you plead guilty or no contest? I mean, sometimes just to mitigate risk, but we want to have a why. We don't just give up. I, I mean, my job is not just plead people out, but you know, anyway, a lot of people will, a lot of people have the public defender as their attorney and part of their job, um, because they have so many cases at the first court date is to see, can we resolve this today? And they obviously are not going to be reviewing a bunch of evidence on that day. Um, so anyway, your attorney talks to the DA. Sometimes the DA will just give us an offer spontaneously on the first day. Usually not. I almost never, maybe there would be some circumstance where it would benefit my client, but I almost never would ask for an offer, which is like a plea deal on the first day. It shows weakness. And it also may seem like if that DA doesn't know me that he thinks I'm just going to act like the public defender. Um, but sometimes we'll get one. If we do, we'll let you know, uh, mostly, I would never have my client accept that first offer like that. Um, and then, okay, we'll wait a long time. <laughs> Lots of waiting. Um, if we are together in court and I can, I will have you wait in the hallway um, unless you're required to be in the courtroom by like the deputy or the court, that specific courtroom's rules, which is rare. You can wait in the hallway. And the reason I want you to wait in the hallway is because you can use your phone. If you sit in the courtroom, as an attorney, I can use my phone or my laptop, but you cannot. Um, and that sucks. And I can't even imagine just like staring and like you see people's sentence, you see scary shit going on. Um, sometimes good stuff, but it, you're also insanely bored for a long period of time. So I'd rather you be able to like read a book, play, I don't know, Plants vs. Zombies. I like that one. <laughs> um, on your phone, in the hallway, just do anything else besides sit there and like stare for a long freaking time while we wait for our case to be called because it generally will be a while. Um, there are so many cases. I know you probably were told, okay, be here at 830. Um, but as you'll quickly learn after your first court date, if charges were filed, 
eight thirty is when all the defendants are told to be there. There are like a hundred people in a courtroom sometimes that are told to be there at eight thirty. Your case is not going to be called at eight thirty. Just the court wants you to be there so that your case could be called then. But the prosecutors don't pay attention to the cases other than at other than at court. So that's basically the time for. I'm trying to summarize this as much as I can. That's basically the time for attorneys to conference, defense attorneys to conference with, to talk, not conference, to talk to the DAs about the case, to say, hey, you didn't turn over the body worn video, can I have it? Whatever, and so there may be, you know, court is from 8.30 to 12, and then from 1.30 to 4.30, and your case could be called anytime during that period of time. So you don't want to be sitting in that time, like watching the, the court, which is very boring, mostly just setting other dates. Anyway, eventually our case will be called, right? And so you and I will go up together and it's different in every courtroom and you and your attorney will go up together if you're not my client. And I'll make sure, and your attorney, your attorney will make sure to tell you where to go. Sometimes you will sit at the counsel table um, within the well, the well is past these like little, there are gates that go like this. Okay, this is like the most coordinated I've ever been. Um, but there are gates that go like that, that are in every, every courtroom I know of in LA County. Do not, oh no, some just go like this. Some don't have a second door. Don't go past that unless you have permission or unless your attorney tells you to because the bailiff may tackle you. I'm not getting that much. Um, you cannot do that. Anyway, that area past the little gate or the two gates, that's the well. Um, do, so you may need to go into that area um, and sit next to your attorney sometimes at the table. Um, you may need to go to a podium, depending which court it is. You may need to stand behind the little like swing door or doors. Um, and okay, so what will the judge, what will happen? So the judge will say, um, to your, so the judge will say your name, um, your attorney will say, you know, for me, Veronica Barton for defendant, for the DA, Mr. DA, for the people, and then the judge will say, counsel, to the defense attorney, do you waive form formal reading of the complaint and statement of rights and enter a plea of not guilty? This is in LA County only, different counties are different for this in California. Um, and your attorney will say yes your honor and then the the prosecutor will um will generally uh, state whatever the date is going to be for the next court date sometimes the defense attorney will say you know your honor we asked to come back on whatever date for our pretrial, um and then we will basically what we're trying to do is get more time so that i can your defense attorney can review the the police report see do we need more information how strong is this case um i want to make sure the da who's actually on the case reviewed all the good things about you hardships you've experienced your side of the story um give time for that so we need to set another date right and because they're not going to do it right then i, I mean i can probably review the whole police report right then but what if there's body worn video that i don't have we need another date the deadline basically for them to give it to us um and the da he has more cases than the public defender so he doesn't really have time to review things at that court date necessarily um anyway so what the judge will ask you then is um mr or miss whatever you have the right to have to it's a felony a speedy preliminary hearing within um 10, 10 calendar days or 60 court days of your arraignment, do you waive and give up that right and agree that we can come back on whatever? This is the only question that the judge will ask you. And what that means is, so you do have some speedy trial and speedy preliminary hearing rights where you get to, like the, basically the government can't just take their sweet time, although they can in some ways with the discovery, but they can't just take their sweet time and not bring you to trial. Um, but why does this matter? So normally it really only matters if you're in custody, if you're out of, like if you're in jail, um, if you couldn't bond out, if your bail is a million dollars, if there's no bail, then you don't want to waive that much time. Like you want your attorney to have time to repair. You want to make sure that you get all the evidence you need, but you're not just going to sit in there for a long time and just wait and chill and have that be okay. Um, and so that's part, of, that's one of your constitutional rights. If you're out of custody, 
for the most part, um, it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, I mean, sometimes I'll have clients who say, I really want this resolve for XYZ reason. And I'll say, okay, well we can not waive time then. And you know, we'll come back earlier and that's fine. Um, or, you know, sometimes I'll have clients that are like, Hey, I just had to take a day off work to be here today. Uh, I really, my boss will be pissed if I, um, if I need to take another day off within the next 60 days, can you please push this out? And then I will, um, to the extent that the judge lets me, but usually that's fine, especially at the first court date. Um, so that is really the only question the judge is going to ask you. Now, let's talk about some caveats. So, so far I've made this sound maybe kind of annoying, but not really that bad, right? Like there's not going to be a trial at the first court date. There's not going to be, you're not going to go to jail at the first court date usually, but that's why I want to give you these caveats. Now, if you are my client and you are watching this video, I will let you know about these things in advance. So please don't watch this video and panic and think, oh my God, is this going to happen to me? I just watched a video of Veronica talking about this. Okay. So there are two big things that can happen at your arraignment that are significant. Um, the first one is that if it's a domestic violence case, or another case in which there is a named victim. So somebody who they're saying like you hit in a bar fight, for example, or, um, you know, if you shot at someone, th those are two examples, but the big one is domestic violence, um, where you live with the person who is the victim. Um, the DA will ask for a restraining order and the restraining order, and they will do this in every single case, no matter what, in LA County, the DA will do this. If they didn't do it, they forgot. Um, they do it with every single case. It is their policy. Um, and you may be thinking, well, wait, it's, but it's my wife. It's, it's me and my wife and I didn't do anything and she regrets this whole case and we don't want a restraining order. It doesn't matter. They will ask for it anyway. And there are certain things and I'll make another video about how we can deal with this, but the DA will ask for a restraining order. If it is granted, then that means that you will have to leave your house. You will have to leave your house. You will not be able to stay there. Um, I mean, of course I've had clients who did stay there and I say to those clients, you must really trust your partner because if they call the cops and the cops come out, you will be arrested and if you were there, the cops came and you were there and he or she was there, the named victim. There's no defense. I mean, at that point we're just trying to, you know, explain, but there's no defense for it. I mean, they've, they've got you totally at that point. So be very, very careful of that. There are many strategies that I have that can avoid that, especially if we have um, a few months before the first court date. Um, there are ways that I can help prep the alleged victim to give a statement, um, things I can have you do, things I can argue, but what will happen usually is, and what the judge has to take as true, is the DA is going to state the things in the police report, the negative things that are written in there about you, and you're going to hear those in court, you know, like, Veronica strangled her boyfriend, held him down on the ground, punched him in the face, and maybe I have my boyfriend there. And he's saying, well, that's that never happened. The cop's a fucking liar. Um, and I'm saying, that didn't happen. Oh my God, all these people in here are hearing about this. Th this didn't happen. I don't want to be kicked out. I have no place to go. Um, it, so what my attorney cannot do if they actually want to help me is argue that didn't happen. No, it wasn't like that. And because for the purposes of the, the restraining order, the judge has to assume that all of that is true. Right. And so there are other arguments that we can make, and I'm not going to go through them just because this video is already getting very long, but it's not to contest it. This is not a trial. And if the judge does grant the restraining order, it doesn't mean that he or she thinks that you did whatever the prosecutor says you did. The prosecutor usually at that point, this is the first time they're even seeing the police report and they literally are reading it out loud. And lots of police reports contain bullshit. All of us in criminal defense, judges, prosecutors, we all know that there's bullshit in there. Sometimes it's not true. Um, anyway, 
so that's the first thing, the restraining order. So that can be significant to some people. If it's some, if it's someone that you are not um, living with anyway, it's probably not that big of a deal. If it's somebody you don't want to see, they don't want to see you, who cares? But if you're living with them, if you have a family, if it's your husband, wife, partner, then roommate, then you need to make sure that you take care of that and uh, implement some good strategies and have something ready for that. Just don't go in and be surprised. Um, okay, so the second really bad thing that can happen is that at the first court date, they can decide to increase your bail. And what does that mean? So increasing your bail means that now, even though maybe you posted bail before, the police let you out OR on your own recognizance, like without posting anything, zero dollar bail. Now they are saying, well, you should be posting, let's say you posted 50,000 before and you paid 5,000 to a bail bondsman, maybe you're on a payment plan. They raise it to 100. Maybe the the DA did go ahead and file increased charges on you. So what that means is that you need to either get a bail bondsman to the courthouse to post that for you, like right now, within a few hours, um, or you're gonna go into jail and you will not get that money that you paid to the bail bondsman back. I'm sorry to say, I mean, it's the first time I ever heard this, this is crazy. There's only one crazier thing I know about how bail bonds work, um, which I won't get into right now. But so what do you do about this? Like I'm telling you something bad can happen. Am I saying to scare you? No, because mostly it doesn't happen. In most cases, if you're my client and I thought this was going to happen, I would let you know. Um, there are a few situations in which this happens. One is that the bail that you originally posted was too low. Like, the, so there's a bail schedule in LA County. There's an amount that if this is the offense and you have like these certain, not qualification, dequalifications, I suppose, um, then they are going to, your bail is going to be at X amount, right? And if the police like either fucked up the calculation or like whatever they charge you with didn't really make a lot of sense and the charges are different from how the DA is filing it, then the DA may ask for a bail increase or the judge may even on his or her own actually increase the bail. Um, so how can we be ready for this? How we can be ready is that there are certain factors that the judge looks at um, other than what the offense is and these dequalification factors in setting your bail. One of them, for example, is your ties to the community. Um, your criminal history is another one of them if you don't have criminal history. And I will tell you a story, this video is so long, but just briefly here. Okay, so I represented a client who was one of two 18 year olds who um, allegedly robbed a 7-Eleven, although you know, if you rob a 7-Eleven, you must know they have HD video. It's better quality than this video that they have there of everybody. So if you go in and you just rob the 7-Eleven with no disguise or anything, they're going to have HD video of you doing it. And they did. So his bail was 50K. His co-defendant's bail was 50K. So that means that they both paid a bail bond something like around $5,000. Um, you can sometimes get discounts from bail bondsmen, but around $5,000. Anyway, so we show up to the first court date and I represent only one of the two, right? So the other guy, get he had a different private attorney. So we have the two guys, two private attorneys, I'm one of the private attorneys. And I talk to the DA and the DA tells me that they are going to ask for a bail increase because this is a 211, a robbery, a strike offense under the three strikes law in California, pretty serious. They're going to ask for a bail increase because uh, they think that the this never should have been $50,000. And frankly, they were right. $50,000 is for like a domestic violence case, a low level felony, a 211 um, with it, this, there was a gun involved too. That's not a $50,000 bond case. I think that the cops maybe tried to go easy on them because they were young, because um, they were just 18. But it doesn't really do them any favors if the bail is increased. So I'm like, oh shit. And I, I was, it, this is one example. At the time, I was a fairly new attorney. Um, but I, so I, I mean, I knew what all this meant, but I was, very nervous about this. Um, I would be very nervous now, but I just, I hadn't had that many of these instances before. And I just thought, oh my God, I can't, I know his family already spent so much money on 
bail in the first place. They don't have that much money. I don't think that they're going to be able to bail him out if they increase this. It could be increased to potentially like 500K, which they don't have $50,000 to add to this. Um, and I just, I did not think that my client would do well at all in in prison and jail. I just, I, I thought, you know, he was somebody that could go one of two ways, either go down a straight path learn from this or go down a really bad path. And I think if he had been in jail at that point, it would have been a really bad path. Okay, so what did I do to to prepare for this? And I do have a happy ending, don't worry. Um, but I already had all of the mitigation about my client. So all the good things about him, hardships that he experienced. I knew that he was already, so his mom was a single mom and they had four kids, including him. Um, he was the oldest and he was only 18, but he was working a part-time job, like part-time. I mean, I think he was working close to 40 hours a week, um, if not that, but he was working in, in addition to going to high school to try to support his family, not for his own self. Um, he had a girlfriend not to move out with her, not to even go to college, nothing, just to like support his family and make sure that they had enough to eat, um, make sure that his mom could pay the rent. And he really needed to be out of custody. Um, I had pictures of him with his high school extracurriculars before it got that bad for his mom and his family. I had all of these, all of these ties, ties to the community, everything already ready. So I was ready. Um, and if I hadn't been then, and I have had clients hire me literally the morning of their court, I would have asked him right then, but I had this stuff. Um, so I'm just like, preparing my argument, writing it all down and very nervously like scratching all this. And I tell the other defense attorney, the private attorney who was much more experienced than me at the time, like, Hey, this is what the DA told me. And I'm all panicked. He didn't seem too excited. Um, didn't see him really talking to his client about it. And I'm nervous. My client's nervous. His mom is nervous. His sister's nervous. We're all nervous thinking shit. Like if he goes into jail, like we, we can't get him out. Um, not, nobody could afford to get him out. <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, I have a little bit of dry throat just from talking so much. Um, and so uh, what happened was, so the case was called, the judge called the case, um, and the DA said, you know, we're asking for this mail increase. And I asked the judge, Your Honor, like, may I be heard? And the judge said, yes, Ms. Barton, go ahead. So I make all the arguments on behalf of my client. Um, and I talked for a while. I, I, not as long as this video, but I talked for a while, um, just telling the judge and I, hopefully showing the judge how much I cared about this client. And this judge is, is hard. Um, Department one of Long Beach court is what it was. If any of you know, you know, um, it was hard, but and he's looking at me just impassively, just no, no change in his facial expression. And then the judge asked the other defense attorney, you know, Mr. Whatever, do you want to be heard? And he says, no, Your Honor, I'll submit. Um, that means I'm not going to make any arguments and just go ahead and do what you will. Well, my client's bond remained the same. His client's bond got increased. Um, and I, I don't remember now what it got increased to, but it was so high that his client was never able to get out of jail for the duration of the case. And how this, like, part of the reason why this made a big impact, and this may not be the only factor, um, I think some of it was, I kept fighting for this client, and the other guy really wasn't fighting that hard for his client from what I saw. Um, but the other guy ended up going to prison, and my client got probation. And, you know, when you are out of custody, you don't have that much pressure on you, right? You're like, you know what? I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep supporting my family. It's all good. When you're in custody, when you're in jail and you get an offer and you're like, well, I'll get out in like however long. And you know, I'm just tired of all this. I just want to know what's going to happen. You're much more likely to take a bad offer. They did essentially the same thing. You know, they were accomplices. They were charged with the same thing. Why would he get an incarceration offer? Oh, my client got probation. I mean, I think most of it was my client wasn't desperate and his client did become desperate. Um, anyway, so that is probably the worst thing that can happen at your arraignment. If you are my client, um, I will let you know ahead of time. I mean, just so you know, I mean, I've had other clients where this guy and his family, they couldn't have a bail bondsman there to post 
the bond if it were to be increased. They just couldn't afford it. But I've had other clients where I told them, hey, the DA says he's going to try to increase your bond. We call the bail bondsman, he comes there. I'm like, we need him waiting in the hallway just in case. I think it will be increased. And then we're able to get them to not increase it. And I'm like, sorry to the bail bondsman. Sorry, you wasted your time. Um, but at least my client was able to get out. So anyway, that may be a little bit of a confusing explanation, but if I think your bond is going to be increased, I will let you know. That story I told, you know, it was early on. I would say now if I saw somebody had 50K bail for a 211, I would, a robbery, I would think, wait a second, why? That's weird, that's very low, and I would give him a heads up before. Um, Anyway, uh, I hope that this helps in what you can expect at your very first court date. I know this is the longest video that I have, but I do want to make sure there's very complete information as much as possible uh, because the first court date, you know, I just, I see people who don't have an attorney. I'm not their attorney and they don't have a public defender assigned yet. They just show up or the public defender, once they are assigned, they have like one minute to talk to them. And I think, how are they supposed to know what to do? How is anybody supposed to know what to do? Like, it must end up being the most jarring experience ever. Um, even if nothing's filed and you're like, how long do I wait? My name is not on the board. Should I just go? It just, it's, the process is crazy. Anyway, if you do have a case in LA County um, or, you know, in Southern California and you need help, you or a loved one, if you do have a court date coming up, um, feel free to go ahead and you can book an appointment below or give me a call.